Wow, Easter Sunday. Oh, that's great. You know, for some people, it's really easy to do Easter. It's just kind of like, it's just a, let's do it. Let's get up and live and be bright and everything like that. And for some people, Easter is kind of a quandary. It's a, I don't know if I ought to get up, you know, and uh, I got to confess, again, this is really weird for a pastor. Um, I'm, I get mixed feelings about Easter. You know, I can do Christmas because, you know, baby Jesus, cattle, uh, sheep, you know, shepherds, wise men, I, I get it. Easter's a little more uh, combative, you know, it's a little more um, uh, violent. Uh, and, uh, and so it has all these m mixed feelings in it. And, and I, so I was tr pondering, you know, why, why did I grow up so weird? You know, uh, and why is being a pastor all these years didn't shake that out of me. But um, so I'm looking back, and, and I probably have told you this before, but, uh, there was an, an Easter Sunday um, shortly after our family returned from Africa. We're living in Whittier, California, with Richard Nixon, and, and, though we didn't know him. And, uh, and uh, next door were the Palucha family, uh, Lindy Palucha, who was, she was like a year older than me. Um, so I knew I didn't have a chance, but I was kind of attracted to her in the same way I was attracted to Snow White, you know, yeah. but um, <laughs> kind of idealistically. But uh, and uh, and Lindy Palucha was so excited because and all the Westfall kids were over were playing in her backyard, and she had gotten that morning. No kidding, they used to do this. Uh, with crazy people in L.A. She had gotten a baby chick named Peepers that. Um, she had, and we all got to pet the baby chick, and it would peep, you know, that's what they do, I guess, you know, and, uh, and uh, it was really cute, we thought that was the greatest thing, and so then from then we started playing everything, and, and we were running around, and, and, you know, we forgot about the chick and everything, but it was a nice thing to have for Easter, we thought, I was a little jealous, you know, we all were, that she got this, and we didn't. We didn't know that they grew up to be chickens, you know, that's a totally different thing, but um, it was kind of a neat Easter thing, and I thought, wow, we're really getting this right this year, and uh, we're playing, and we're getting more rambunctious, and then pretty soon we started playing uh, tag, and then we started playing blind man bluff, which is like tag, but with uh, a blindfold, you know, on, and uh, we took turns being the blindfolded one, and it was my turn, and we were all laughing, and I was chasing everybody around, and, and now just really, just like the Olympics with super slow-mo, I was reaching to tag somebody, and I went into this slow motion turn. I mean, really, and it was like slow motion, and my foot slipped, and we're all laughing and laughing and laughing, and I fell back in the grass, and I'm laughing hysterically, and I realized no one else is laughing. And I'd landed on peepers. And we're talking. <laughs> this is terrible. Why would I tell the story on Easter? No. <laughs> and so the whole thing, and, and of course, Lindy Palucha never forgave me, and I didn't know what to do, and it was, a, uh, it was the saddest day. Of the, and, and I dreaded Easter ever since then, and um, I was afraid somebody would get a baby chick and I would ruin everything. And um, fortunately, God moves to San Diego later that year, and so I got away and never had to be reminded of my pain and failure um, and my destroying the joy of my neighbor girl that I had a secret crush on, you know. <laughs> now, so I'm thinking, okay, so this is what went into my little mind shaping me at Easter. It's a tragedy and joy and celebration. Tragedy and joy and celebration. And then I realized that's exactly what Easter is and that's why we have such strange feelings about it. Uh, you, you have the, the brutal, violent death of Christ and uh, the dashing of hopes, and, and then you have the uh, Easter started with, uh, with an earthquake, right? If your daughter read that. Uh, Easter started with an earthquake, which is not subtle, and um, the stones rolled away, and the soldiers are in shock, and all these things happening, and it was calamitous, and... Um, and people have mixed feelings. Uh, when she read that passage, remember, how did the women who came to, to the empty tomb, how did they leave? The Bible says in, in Matthew 28, they left with fear and joy. Isn't that weird? They left with fear and joy. Just like us. 
just like us, mixed feelings and, uh, and what does this mean and oh my, and yet joyful and celebration and, and praise all mixed in at once. And uh, I think Easter is God's ultimate way of saying, deal with me. You know, that's basically what it is. Um, Maybe Christmas is give me a, give me a shot here, you know. Let me, let me give me a chance, and and, and I'll grow into it. But uh, Easter is you got to deal with me. You got to deal with life and death, your own and Jesus. You have to deal with eternity. You've got to deal with heaven and earth. You've got to deal with all this, the purpose of life, the meaning of life, why you're here, where you're going, how you're going to get there. All these questions hit us at Easter. Now, no one was confident that first Easter, we know that, I mean, uh, nobody was confident. Uh, even, it, it was, you know, the women who went, uh, which is one of the, probably the biggest proofs that this wasn't a faked story that the church wrote up because the women weren't even allowed to give testimony in court. They, they, they were considered so much, so lower. And so the fact that they were the first witnesses, you know, it, back then, if the Bible had been faked, they would have had, you know, Peter, maybe Zacchaeus, those kind of guys would have been the ones who'd gotten to the tomb first, you know, not the women, but they were. And then when, then when, they, when they ran back and they told the disciples, what was the disciples' response? You're nuts! <laughs> Typical response, you know. Uh, we're not listening to you. The, they weren't confident about it. They weren't receptive to it. Peter runs all the way, uh, panting for breath because he's probably out of shape, and he's running, and he gets there, he looks in, and then instead of being a, a man of faith, what's he do? He shrugs and walks away. Isn't that weird? That's the response. And uh, the Bible never tells us how Jesus rose from the dead. It never tells us how, what happened, you know, internally and the, or externally or spiritually, anything like that. All we know is he got up, he wasn't there, you know, and uh, that's all the Bible says. And, and it, it, you know, not adequate for us all. Um, uh, some of the disciples were skeptical, like some of us today. Uh, you're going, okay, you know, I'm going along with this, but I don't really, I don't know, you know, we'll see. And, uh, and that, was, that seemed okay. Um, I love, and we've talked about this before in Easter, that my favorite passage is in uh, Matthew 28, about verse 17. Uh, the disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go, and when they saw him, they worshipped him. They all worshipped him, but some doubted. So even the worshipers were doubting. That was okay. That didn't, that didn't slow Jesus down at all. He didn't go, well, I guess I better go back in the grave because we got some people who are doubting. <laughs> it's not really unanimous. I, I guess it didn't work. You know, it just went on. Okay. Keep worshiping with your doubts. The religious leaders, I love this, you know, because uh, I was a religious leader, you know, <laughs> and uh, they were so spin-doctoring the whole thing, you know. They were so obsessed with what people think. How can we make this look? How can we interpret this? How can we control how, how people interpret it? And, uh, and so they've got their own plans going, you know, it's set rumors going, let's do stuff. And, and, uh, and I love it when... Uh, in uh, Matthew 27, when the, they go to back to Pilate, you know, Pilate's, he didn't want to deal with this anymore, you know, he washed his hands of it, but they go back to him and say, okay, what are you going to do to make this grave secure? What are you going to do to make sure that, you know, there isn't some kind of weird thing where those followers come and steal his body? And I love what he said. He said, okay, you can take a, a group of soldiers and then make the tomb as secure as you know how. That's the quote. Make it as secure as you know how. Gave it right back to him. Uh, how secure can you make it? And uh, and they were probably worried, you know, that <coughs> they're worried that he, he wouldn't rise from the dead like he said he would. But I think they were also worried that he might. And how do we 
control this? How do we control what people think and how they respond? And how do we keep a handle on this? Not very effectively. Now, so I'm looking at this and thinking, okay, so what is the key for us at, at Easter this year, right now? With all of our stuff that's happening, mixed of celebrations, sorrows, disappointments, uh, bewilderment, uh, all of those things happening. What can we do? What's one thing that we can do that would change everything? Let me share another passage with you if I can find it here in this old Bible. Um, there we go. Philippians chapter 2. It says, uh, Jesus didn't consider equality with God as something to be grasped, to be clung to. He made himself nothing, taking on the nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on the cross. Get this. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that's above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven, on earth, under the earth, wherever you are, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. Now, I thought about that. Jesus lets go of his rights, humbles himself, is brutally killed, and God lifts him up and makes him the object of worship. And we come to worship today and, uh, and worship the word comes to the word worth, worth that we're, we're exercising worthship, that we're saying that, that Jesus is, is worthy, worth something. There, there's, a, there's an old quote, I was digging around trying to find out who said it, I can't remember, so I'm sorry if it was you, okay, uh, but it was, um, everybody knows what everything costs, and nobody knows what anything's worth. Isn't that great? We don't know what's worth. And yet, um, when we say we worship Jesus, the risen Lord, on Easter, on any day, we're saying we give value and we give worth to you. And we, and we recognize your worth. Now, so I went to the very back of the Bible, back by the maps, you know? When you get back there, that's, ooh. That gets serious. Um, so back there in um, Revelation, and the greatest passage, which you all read, is kind of a responsive reading. You read parts of it today. At the end of history, at the, at the end of history, John's writing this vision that he has uh, while he's uh, exiled on the island of Patmos, just off of, from Ephesus. And uh, he's in exile, and he has this vision. He writes it down, and he talks about, I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides, sealed with seven seals. And, and scholars say that this is like the, the scroll of, of human history and, and meaning and purpose and all of our questions, all these kind of things. And, uh, and I saw an angel proclaiming in a loud voice, who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? But no one in heaven, no one on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. And I wept and I wept because no one could be found who was worthy to open the scroll and look inside. Then I saw a lamb, looking as if it had been slain, standing in the center of the throne, encircled by living creatures and elders. And they sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and open the seals, because you were slain, and with your blood you purchased people for God. From every tribe and language and people and nation, you've made them to be a kingdom of priests to serve, and they will reign on earth. 
And I looked and heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands and 10,000 times 10,000. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and elders, and they said in a loud voice, they sang, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Then, if that wasn't enough, then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea now, and all that's in them singing, to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. And the living creatures fell down and worshiped. Now, that, if that's the end of history, if that's the culmination of what our lives are to be, we need to start now with one choice, and that's the choice to praise Jesus right where we are, right now. Now, here's how I'm so screwed up. I thought, growing up and through most of my life, as soon as I get this stuff worked out, I'm going to praise God. <clears throat> As soon as I get it solved, I'm going to bring my praises. As soon as all these issues in my life, and my family, and, that, and, and, and all your stuff, you know, that we get to deal with, when, when all that's fixed, then I'm really going to praise with a full heart and a full voice. And I'm going to praise and I'm going to say, thank you, Lord, and I praise you, and you're worthy when all of this is fixed. Do you know how long I've waited to praise God? I have like waited and waited because there's always one more thing, you know. You know, this is our first Easter without our son because he's locked up in detox and can't get out this week. So last night I'm at home crying. Well, I'm not going to praise God until he's through that. Well, then there'll be something else, won't there? And when I get all my issues worked out, whoa, I don't know if Jesus has enough time for that. I got issue upon issue. And so what happens is, what happens, I go through my life waiting to praise God, but not doing it. See, I'm asking him for stuff. I'm going to him with my issues, you know. I'm trying to be grateful along the way, but I'm not ready to praise him because there's still stuff. Right? Not like you guys, you know, you don't have stuff, but. <laughs> and then I realized, I've got this whole thing screwed up. It's all wrong. I've been wrong all these years, why? Because we start with praise. Now. And in doing that, we discover that things work out down the road, but we start with the praise. If we wait till everything's worked out, it never happens. And so, um, I was I was reading uh, <laughs> Helmut Tilke, a German theologian, and I was at the end of his book here, and he says, so to praise God means to see things from the perspective of the end of things, like the end of time and what happens there. We can praise a person only when we've seen what they've accomplished. But we must praise God in order to see what he accomplishes. And therefore, we should praise him at the very moments in life when there seems to be no way out. That's when we praise him. Then we'll learn to see the way out for our own life simply because God is there at the end of every way and every blind alley. When we praise God, regardless in every situation, we discover that he's with us. And he won't leave us, and he won't forsake us, as he, as he promised us here at the end of uh, Matthew 28. Um, and then we begin to see the way out. But it starts with praise. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive honor and power and wealth and glory. And we say, I know the worth of God. I know the worth of Jesus. I know the worth of Easter. And it may be that, you know, you fell on peepers too, somewhere along the line, and you blew it, and your life was a mess from then on, and, it, and relationships are broken, and Lindy Palucha will never love you, you know? Maybe that's your story too. Or maybe you were peepers, and the world's fallen on you, and you didn't see it coming, and you were just there, and 
you know, life took you out. And you're going, what now? What now is what we all have to do, which is we praise Jesus regardless. We start there. We don't see they went to the mountain with Jesus. They all worshiped. Some doubted, yeah. Just like every church in America, <laughs> every church in the world, that's half doubting, half not. But they're all worshiping. Why? Because that's the beginning. That's the beginning. That's not the end. I mean it will be the end, but it starts here. And we become part of that giant chorus that God brings together and says you are worthy. So that's what I want to tell you on Easter today. And I want you to hold me to it. I want to, I want to not wait to praise God. I'm not going to wait till I get to heaven and then I'll say, okay, I can learn some of these choruses, you know. <laughs> I'm not going to do that now. I'm, I'm making a commitment to you. I'm going to start with praise when I'm in the mess. And then look over and say, thank you, Lord, for being here with me. I wouldn't have seen you otherwise.